Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Fun Fridays, an event that we have every Friday at 10 a.m. I'm Miss Kate. I'm from the Jersey City Free Public Library, and we're also working with the Jersey City Public Schools Special Education Department so that we can have our sensory story time. So last week, I built a fort. And this week I'm back in my fort. So if you need to take some time, if you want to build a fort, feel free to pause this or you can come back later because this video will be online. So you can always come back to watch it whenever you want. I have a spot that has lots of pillows. I have my blanket. I have my stuffed animals. So whatever makes a cozy spot for you, I invite you to create a cozy spot so that we can read some books together and have some fun. And I'm ready. As I said, I'm in my fort. I have all my things. So the first book that we're going to read is a nonfiction book. Does everyone remember what a nonfiction book is? It's a book that teaches us something and is filled with facts. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is our grades three to grades five uh, story time. So I think a lot of people are familiar with fiction and nonfiction books. And if not, that's okay. We're here to learn together. So we're going to start with a nonfiction book. And I'm going to start with a book that's from Hoopla, which is free through the library. So you can use your library card to sign up and then you can read lots of books. So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. So you can see the cover of the book that we're going to read today. This book is called Keeping Warm with Fur and Fat by Hannah Fields. And if you're new to reading on Hoopla, just swipe to the side and that's how you turn the page on your device. You can read it using the computer, an iPad or tablet or a phone. So it's really good. You can have books wherever you go. That's why I always like to have at least one story from our digital resources. Digital just means our online um, resources. And uh, yeah, so that you can see all the different things you can, all the different ways you can read. So this one, we're going to learn a lot of things. We can look at the table of contents and we can see where we will learn about adapting for winter, special wool, musk os, ox basics. I don't know anything about a musk ox, so I bet we're going to learn a lot. Grizzly facts, winter sleep, weasels of the sea. Any guesses what the weasels of the sea are? I'm going to guess a seal. Let's see if we're right. Fantastic fur, Arctic survivors, adapting fur for hunting. Is blubber fat? And of course, most nonfiction books have the glossary indexes, index and websites or uh, further reading we can do. So let's get started. Page four, adapting for winter. Animals adapt or change to better survive their environments. Adaptations help animals hide or get away from danger. Some, some adaptations also help animals fight off predators. Now, remember that words that are in the glossary are darker. So is the word hmm, adaptation? If we're just looking at page four, would we guess adaptation is in the glossary? Since it's not darker than the other words, I don't think that word would be in the glossary based on page four. Maybe in another page, we'll see it darker. But what word on this page do we know will be in the glossary? Environments, because the word environments is darker than the other words. All right, let's see what else. Mammals are warm-blooded animals whose babies drink milk and whose bodies are covered with hair or fur. Warm-blooded animals must keep their body around the same temperatures at all times. This requires lots of energy, which comes from food. Fur and fat helps animals living in colder climates use less energy to keep their body at the, excuse me, at the right temperature. 
If the animal can't find food, its body will burn stored fat to produce energy. Well, sorry about the line at the bottom. Hopefully it won't bother you. And then we see a caption with the image. Does anyone know what these animals are on page five? These look like whales. Let's see what it says. Although not covered in hair or fur, whales are mammals. We said whales, we're right. They breathe air, are warm blooded and give birth to live babies that drink milk. Whales, dolphins, seals and walruses are marine animals. Can we guess what marine, what marine mammals are? Where do mammals that are marine mammals live? So if we look at the picture and we see they live in the water, we can guess marine means animals that live in the water. Special wool. Mus musk oxen are hairy mammals that live in Arctic areas of Canada, Alaska, and Greenland. The hair covering a musk ox's body is thick and grows to be about two feet long, almost touching the ground. Under this hair, the musk ox has a layer of thick, soft wool called keviat. I've never heard of keviat before. Short hair covers the musk ox's face. The musk ox sheds its wool in summer. During the warmer months, the hairy herbivores eat more grasses and plants. The food they eat is stored as fat to keep them warm and give them energy during the winter months. Keeping warm with the musk ox. So we see the long hair at the bottom. We see the keviat. Then we see the horn that's by its ears. And we see the short hair on its face. Musk ox basics. Males and females come together for two months in late summer to mate. After eight months, female musk oxen give birth to one calf each. Herds of musk oxen circle their young and point their horns toward a predator if they feel threatened. The way they gather together makes it easy for humans to hunt them for their meat and super soft wool. Hmm. Adaptation answers. So now I'm going to read the caption of it. When they cannot eat grass because it's covered in snow, female musk oxen can use the stored energy in their fat to help produce milk to feed their calves. Interesting. Oh, look at the baby. Musk ox Kivia is eight times warmer than sheep wool and is softer than cashmere. However, Kivia is very rare. This makes it very a very valuable fiber for making clothing. Musk oxen almost died out because they were overhunted. Today, laws protect them from being hunted. And then let's read about the baby in the caption. After just a few hours, newborn musk ox calves can keep up with their mothers and herds. This helps keep them safe from predators. That's good. So they get pretty fast um, quickly after they're born. Mm, cute. And then on page 10, what are we going to learn about? Bears, specifically grizzly bears. Grizzly facts. Grizzly bears are one of two species or kinds of brown bear found in North America. They live in forests and prairies, as well as meadows located below the woods on very tall mountains. They once roamed throughout the Western United States, but their habitats have been reduced. Most live in Alaska and Northern Canada. Adult grizzly bears can weigh around 700 pounds and live to be about 30 years old. Their fur can be anywhere between tan and dark brown. Grizzly bears are omnivores. They commonly eat plants, fruits, berries, and grass. 
They eat. They also eat salmon, small mammals, deer, and even moose. And then the caption says, grizzly bears spend most of their time alone. However, large groups of grizzlies gather when salmon swim upstream in the summer months. The fat from salmon helps grizzly bears survive the winter. Winter sleep. So what's another word for winter sleep? Hibernate. Let's learn more about this. Winter can be a hard time for grizzly bears to find food. During summer and fall, they eat as much food as they can find to build up fat. Grizzly bears dig a den or hole into a hillside. As they settle down to sleep inside, their heart rate slows and their body temperature drops. They live off stored fat while they sleep for up to seven months. Experts say that bears don't actually hibernate. They do sleep most of the winter. True hibernators, such as bats, wake up slowly. However, if a bear is disturbed, it wakes up quickly. Oh, interesting. Female grizzly bears give birth to cubs or babies in winter months. The mothers use energy from stored fat to produce milk for their cubs. They care for their cubs in the den until they're ready to come out in spring. Weasels of the sea. So do you remember what you guessed? I guessed a seal, but looking at this picture, I think I was wrong. What is this animal? It's a sea otter. Sea otters are one of 13 species of otters, which are part of the weasel family. Sea otters live along the northern coasts of the Pacific Ocean. There are two subspecies of sea otters in the United States, the California or Southern sea otter and the Alaskan or Northern sea otter. And the caption says, sea otters often drift on the water's surface. They wrap their body in sea plants growing from the ocean floor to keep from floating away. Hmm. Sea otters don't have a protective layer of fat. This means that they can't store energy to use when they're cool, cold. Sea otters eat about 25% of their own weight each day because they burn energy so quickly. This energy keeps, keeps their bodies warm. That is a lot. If you weigh 60 pounds, 25% of your weight is 15 pounds. I used to have a little dog that weighed 15 pounds. See if you can find something that weighs that much and imagine if you ate that much food every day. Oof. Oh, here's Lexi. Hi, Lexi. Do you wanna learn about fantastic fur with us? We'll see if she stays. Fantastic fur. Unlike most marine mammals, which have a thick layer of fat to keep them warm, sea otters depend on their fur to keep warm. Their fur is very thick. They have up to a million hairs per square inch. Most humans have only 100,000 hairs on their heads. Oh my goodness. So I might have a million hair, hairs all over my head but a square inch is like this much. So they have all of this hair in this much space. That's a lot of hair or fur, I should say. Well, no hairs. A layer of air gets trapped between sea otters, thick fur and their skin. This protects them from the cold water. It also helps them float. Sea otters spend up to two or three hours a day grooming their fur. Dirty or tangled fur will not keep the cold water out. Fur. Adaptation answers. Sea otters use their paws to clean their fur and fluff it up with air bubbles. They are very flexible creatures, so cleaning hard to reach places is easy. Sea otters give birth in the water. They are the only otter species to do this. 
Mothers hold their babies on their chest while they're floating on while floating on their back. Oh, look at the mommy and baby sea otter. So cute. Arctic survivors. Arctic foxes can be found in the coldest parts of the world, including Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Russia, Norway, Scandinavia, and Iceland. They are nine to 12 inches tall at the shoulder, about the size of a house cat. Adaptation answers. Arctic foxes stay active year round, including winter. This is possible because they have a thick layer of fat underneath their fur that keeps them warm in the low Arctic temperatures. Their small bodies help keep them warm, but their most important feature is their fur. Arctic foxes have thick, multi-layered fur that helps them survive temperatures as low as negative 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Whoa. They also have thick fur on their paws that allow them to easily walk across snow and ice. Arctic foxes mainly eat lemmings, a type of rodent. If they can't find a source of food to hunt, they might eat food left behind by other predators, such as polar bears. Adapting fur for hunting. The Arctic fox has adapted so its fur changes with the seasons. In summer, their coat is brown or gray. So we see on this side of the page, the gray or brown fur. This helps them blend in with their summer environment. During the winter, Arctic foxes have a coat of thick white fur. Not only does the fur keep them warm, it lets them blend in with the ice and snow that are everywhere in winter. Adaptation answers. Arctic foxes have special hunting skills. When they hear their prey under the snow, they leap into the air and pounce through the snow on their next meal. Interesting. So if something's hiding under the snow, they can kind of dive into it. Oof. By blending in with their surroundings, Arctic foxes have an easier time hunting. The color of their fur makes it easier for them to sneak up on their prey because the prey can't see them coming. And then in the caption, Arctic foxes use their furry tail to shield themselves from the cold wind. This also helps keep their body from losing heat. Hmm. Is blubber fat? What do you think? I'm going to guess it's different because why would they have a whole section about it? Let's see. Many marine mammals, such as whales and seals, have a thick layer of blubber. This protective layer isn't like the fat that land animals and humans have. It's much thicker than the fat a grizzly bear or a musk ox has. In fact, some scientists don't think of blubber as fat at all. They think of it as a type of connective tissue or a part of the body that holds together other parts of the body. Blubber connects an animal's internal organs to its skin. So some of our internal organs are our stomach, our heart, our lungs, but they don't need skin to stay in place. For the marine mammals, it seems like the blubber helps their internal organs stay in place. Interesting. Blubber stores energy and keeps marine mammals warm. It even helps them float. Can you guess who our visitor is? Lexi, would you like to come into the fort? Hi, Lexi, you can come if you want. Looks like we're at the end. So we see the glossary, which is like our mini dictionary. So we can see words like habitat, which is the natural home for plants, animals, and other living things, or omnivore. Do you know what omnivore means? An animal that feeds on both plants and other animals. So it eats plants and meat. Then we see our index. So if we wanted to know, hmm, 
hmm, what does it say about blubber? We can go to the B section and learn where, where in the book we would find blubber. And then we see some websites. So due to the changing nature of the internet links, uh-oh, Lexi's on this side now, but this isn't a side she can come in. Lexi, go away, get out of our fort. <laughs> now she's playing high five with me. <laughs> Excuse me, Lexi. All right. And then we see some other titles. So if you liked this book, there's a whole series like fighting with fangs and claws or staying safe with scales and scoots. I don't know what a scoot is. That might be interesting to read. And then we can see if you can find it on Hoopla because there's lots of books on Hoopla. All right, I'm going to get Lexi off the roof of my fort and I'm gonna come back with another book. See you soon. All right, we had to take a break from the tents. You'll see I had to put my tent away because today we're going to read Hannah's Cold Winter and there's only a physical copy of this book. I couldn't find it online, but I love the story so much that I wanted to be sure to share it with you. So this is Hannah's Cold Winter written by Trish Marks and illustrations by Barbara Knutson. And it's based on a true story. Hannah's Cold Winter. Can you guess what kind of animal Hannah will be? This is a hippopotamus, so I'm gonna guess she's a hippopotamus. Hannah's Cold Winter. And does anyone know what city this is? It's hard to tell just by looking at it, but when we read, then you can make a better guess. All right. When I was a child, Sunday was my favorite day. Papa would wake up rested after working all week at the paprika mill outside of town. For six days, summer and winter, he would pull heavy bags of dried peppers off the farmer's cart carts and haul them into the gaping mouth of the paprika factory where they were ground into a fine spice. Papa used to say that the mouth of that factory was the only thing that was harder to feed than the mouths of his three children. And these are really pretty pictures. I'll try to get closer. But that was on the six days during the week. On the seventh day, on Sunday, Papa could sleep until the sun woke him up. We would wait for him to come into the kitchen, dressed in his suit and his red bow tie and the gold cufflinks his grandfather had given to him when he got married. Well, well, he would say, trying to look stern. I suppose I shall have no peace today. I suppose I shall have to wait to sit by the fire and drink your mother's good coffee. Your faces tell me you want to go out today. We had been holding our breath, hoping Papa would say that. We had traveled all over Budapest and sometimes to villages in the country on these Sunday outings with Papa and Mama, and each of us had a special statue or building or park. I loved the carved stone lions guarding the bridge over the Danube River. My sister begged to go to the baths at the Gellert Hotel and see the painted tiles and feel the steam rising from the water that bubbled up from the ground. So here we see the bridge over the Danube. And these lions, since I'm a librarian, they make me think of the lions at the New York Public Library. I wonder if they're connected. And then these are the baths. So Budapest is famous for having these kinds of baths that you go to as a family. My older brother, Gabor, who had pocket money would run across the street from the baths to the market where the farmers brought, brought their eggs and tomatoes and chickens. He would soon be lost in the maze of cheese stalls and spices counters, but he always came out with candy for us all. Oh, what a nice brother. It's always nice when other people are thoughtful. 
There was one place that was a favorite for all of us, but we never asked Papa to take us there because it cost money. We knew that when there were extra foreigns after buying Mama's sugar and butter and the cloth for new pants and new shoes for whichever one of us had grown too much, Papa would stand in the kitchen and put his hand in his pocket and jingle his coins and smile a big smile. Then we knew it was a zoo Sunday. The zoo in our town was down a big hill and across the river from where we lived. Papa would lift Ava onto his shoulders and clasp my hand in his. And with Gabor running ahead, we would walk down the hill and over the river into the city of Pest. So this is taking place in Budapest. On one side of the river is the town called Buda and the other side is Pest. So that's a little interesting fun fact. Coming home, we would take the cog train that groaned its way up the hill. But going down was a game of chase, of hide and seek, and always of Papa's riddles. Little Tabor, he would ask me. Those favorite lions of yours on the Lanchid Brid. Tell me, what is missing from the lions who guard the bridge of Lanchid? It's hard to tell. I knew the answer. I knew the tongues were what was missing, but I always let Papa tell me, and we would listen to his hearty laugh. <laughs> now that you know, it's easy to see, but it was hard for me to guess. Okay. Soon, we would reach the zoo. The balloon men and ice cream ladies lined the street in front of the entrance. Hurry, hurry, one of them would shout. It is feeding time for Hannah. Now, do you remember who Hannah is? Is it a person? No, it's an animal. Do you remember what kind of animal? If you forgot, here's your clue. Hannah's a hippo. Hannah was a hippopotamus. Our city was famous for its hippos. They loved the warm springs that came naturally out of the ground, and they grew fat and healthy and had many babies that were sent to zoos all over the world. Our city had built them a beautiful house in the zoo. It looked like a miniature palace with copper domes and a large pool in front and separate rooms with pools on the inside. Trees and flowers were planted around the hippo house and the water was always kept clean. I mean, that's nicer than my house. Lucky hippos. So we can see that the people of Budapest really love these hippos. Oh, wow, look at that. Hannah was a special hippo. She liked being in the outside pool close to the people. She often slept with one eye open, hoping that she would see the cart loaded with grass and hay creaking down the curved path. While the other hippos rested, she would get up just when the cart reached the giraffe house next door. Hannah was the only hippo who was ready, mouth open, when the zookeeper had his first pitchfork full of hay poised in midair. She would keep her mouth open until the keeper could get no more hay in. Then, as fast as a hippo can, she would close her mouth. In a flash, it seemed, her mouth was open again and all the hay was gone. The crowd would laugh, ha, 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 Papa, loudest of all. That was one riddle even he could not figure out. Yeah, how can she eat it so quick? She must swallow it whole. One winter, the river between the twin towns of Buda and Pest froze. It was a big river and the winter had to be very cold for so much water to freeze, but no one talked about it much. As something much more important was happening to us, there was a war going on all over our part of Europe and beyond. 
There were now soldiers in our town on the banks of the river and the soldiers on either side were fighting each other. The people would shake their heads, go to their work, then come home and stay inside. Papa no longer took us out on Sundays. We sat by the hearth and studied our lessons and mended our worn clothing and listened to the radio, hoping for better news. It, people don't listen to the radio as much, maybe if they're in the car. Now people watch TV, but before they had to listen to the radio to get all of the news. But the soldiers stayed and the days grew colder. Our meat ran out, then our potatoes. Papa would come home with only a few onions and carrots from the market. And with these vegetables and sometimes with some thin chickens our neighbor gave us, Mama always managed to stretch our soup pot. So these are really nice pictures. That's what they looked like at home and that's what it looked like outside. So it seemed like it was a little dangerous outside and they should stay inside. We were so busy thinking of our own hollow stomachs that Papa's news came as a surprise. The animals in the zoo are hungry too, he said. I heard that because of the soldiers, no food is coming into the town and the animals need more food when winters are this cold. We thought of Hannah and her wide grin and of how much hay her mouth could hold. We thought of her baby born that summer and of all our famous hippos in the zoo. We went to bed that night feeling helpless and sad. In the morning, Papa was in the kitchen, in his suit. His hands were in his pockets and he had a big smile on his face. We are going to the zoo, he said, but not for fun. We are going to save the zoo today. If you children get dressed and come with me, I will show you how. I like that this Papa is letting his kids help because Kids can do a lot of things. If you see a problem, you can always try to fix it because you guys can do a lot. We scrambled to our rooms and, no and in no time we're back in the kitchen. Mama wrapped mufflers around our necks. The way she looked, we knew she and Papa had stayed up late thinking of a plan to save the hippos and that it was a good one. On the way out of our house, Papa picked up picked up our straw doormat and an old pair of straw slippers. Gabor, Ava, and I whispered together, but we knew Papa would share his secret only when he was ready. On the way to the zoo, Papa told us what he and Mama had planned. We are going to the zookeeper, the first thing he said, and we will take him to the hippo house to show him that the plan will work. When we got to the hippo house, we could see a frozen pond and bare trees around it. The hippos were huddled inside for warmth and shelter from the wind. Hannah no longer looked our way, no longer slept with one eye open. We could hardly tell which hippo she was. Papa walked up to the hunched animals and gently put the straw mat under the nose of one. The hippo moved but did not eat. So Papa got a pitchfork and broke the mat up and put the pieces of the old mat on the end of the fork. Then Papa offered our tattered mat to the hippo. The old hippo raised himself up and opened his mouth and the mat was gone in a twinkling. Well done, said the zookeeper. Well done. Wow, look. So they're able to feed the hippo eventually with their old doormats. That's pretty good thinking. After that day, on cold nights and on gray mornings, in mist and in fog and in snow, an old cart pulled by an older horse traveled the streets of Buddha and Pesht. Feed the hippos, straw for the hippos. The driver's voice echoed through the streets. See him going through. So this is, there weren't cars driving around right then. The people of my town ran out of doors and piled their old straw mats and slippers and hats onto the cart. 
The cart was filled time and time again, and the old horse faithfully pulled each load to Hana and the other hippos at the zoo. By the end of the winter, the people of Budapest had given 9,000 hats and mats and slippers to the hippos. The hippos did not grow fat, but the straw kept them alive through that cold and frightening winter. Well, you can hear there is an ambulance going by, so sorry about all the noise. The war in our town ended that spring. Now I am grown up in the cold winter and the soldiers are only a memory. But the hippos in Budapest are still living in their palace and wallowing in the warm springs. I have traveled far since those days. Every time I see a hippo in a zoo someplace in the world, I think of Hana and of Papa and the brave people of my own town who saved their hippos during the war with 9,000 straw slippers. And then we don't have time to read the author's note, but I'm going to show you. And if you want to read it, to pause and read the story from the author about the true story of the book. So this is not based on a real family, but it's based on the true story of how some families saved the hippos and other animals in the zoo. And then the author even got to visit Hana herself. So I'm going to show this and you can pause and hopefully be able to read it from the screen if you're interested in the author's note. So you can push pause and then unpause when you're ready. And then I'll turn because there's so much, so many words. All right, so. Hopefully you enjoyed this story as much as I do. I think it's a really sweet story about how people can help animals, even in, in tough times, there was a war going on, but they still thought about the animals and kept them alive. And I just think that's really remarkable and special. Um, so maybe this story will invite you to help an animal you see, or even a person that you know, because we can help each other too. And um, you can check this book out from the library. It's not online, so you have to order a physical copy, but hopefully you do, or you can read it again using the YouTube link. And now it's time for a fun activity uh, with Jersey City Public Schools Department of Special Education. So stay tuned and get ready to keep having fun on Fun Fridays. I'll hand it over now. Hello, everybody. We hope you enjoyed the reading of Hannah's Cold Winter. Today for your activity, we will be playing a trivia game. There are some rules that we need to follow for this trivia game. You will have one minute to find the answer to each question if you do not already know it. Remember, you can use the internet, somebody that is home, or a friend. Use the chat box to type in the answer of the question. Always remember to be respectful in your answers. The chat box is being monitored. And most importantly, have fun. Our first question, who is Hannah? That's right, Hannah is a hippopotamus. Where does Hannah's Cold Winter take place? I want you to think about the setting of this story. Remember, setting means time and place of the story. Hannah's Cold Winter takes place in Budapest, Hungary. It looks like a beautiful city. What continent is Hungary located in? There are seven continents.
Hungary is located in Europe. And if you can take a look at the map, it's the light green country right in the middle. Where did Papa work? Papa worked in a paprika mill. Paprika is a type of spice that comes from a red pepper. And you can see the red pepper is all right there. Paprika is very popular in Hungarian cooking. What is Budapest famous for? There are two answers for this question. Budapest is famous for their baths and of course, their hippos. Where was the family's favorite place to visit? Remember, they would go here on Sundays if Papa had enough money. That's a little clue for you. You're right, the zoo. How big can hippos open their mouths? Well, that's pretty big. 150 degrees. What do hippos eat? Are they carnivores? That means that they're meat eaters. Or, or are they herbivores? That means they eat grass, veggies, berries, etc. Hippos are herbivores. You can see a hippo there eating the grass that's growing from the ground. What is a group of hippos called? This one's it in the story. You might have to use Google for this one. A bloat. How did people get their news during this time setting? Remember, this story took place a long time ago, so it was way before any TVs.
the radio. The radios back then looked a lot different than they do now. Why did the family go back to the zoo? They wanted to feed the hippos their old doormats. Remember, this was a time where a lot of people were going hungry, especially the animals. And the doormats that they had were made out of hay and straw. And our final question, how many mats and slippers were the people from Budapest able to bring to the hippos? Nine thousand. We hope you enjoyed your trivia game. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to Fun Friday. I hope you enjoyed the read aloud of Hannah's Cold Winter, and I know you definitely had fun playing that trivia game because I had fun playing. Before we move on to a writing exercise, I just wanted to briefly go over some of my favorite parts of the story. So the first thing I wanted you to take notice. Uh, was that the story was written in, from a first person point of view. Well, what does that mean? That means that the story is told through the narrator's eyes. It's not being told by Miss Valdora telling you what happened to this little boy and Hannah during World War II. It's being told from his own experiences and what he did. Keywords. I, we, me, my. That tells you it's written in first person point of view. So just something to keep in mind. The second thing is I really enjoyed the story setting. I really enjoy visiting Europe. So when I get to read a story that shows me a city or a country in Europe, I just love it. So in the story, we got to travel, travel <laughs> to Hungary into the city of Budapest very fun. I wish I, I got to go there. We were also brought back into a different era. We are no longer in 2021, but now we're in a story that takes place during World War II. Now, luckily, you and I were not alive during this time, but this was a much different time period to live in. And if you would like suggestions for some books, I'm sure Miss Kate would love to give you a list of books that you could read to learn more about World War II. The next thing I wanted to point out is there was two conflicts going on in the story. The first one, which I just mentioned, there was a war going on. Now wartime means people are fighting. Uh, you don't have as much freedom as you have now to go outside and play. In the story, the soldiers were blocking the roads so that food couldn't get through. And the family talked about how they didn't have as much food as they used to have. They had enough food to survive, but they weren't able to indulge in like chocolate cake every night, right? Which I hope nobody in listening into this right now is eating chocolate cake every night. <clears throat> so the second part of the story or the conflict was that the animals at the zoo were also facing food insecurities. Food was so scarce for them. They had no food because the soldiers were blocking the food from getting to them. The family and the city came up with a clever solution to this awful predicament of no food for the animals at the zoo. What did they do to make sure the animals at the zoo survived? Well, they didn't give them Pizza Hut, right? That's right. They took the horse and buggy through the town announcing, we need hay, we need straw. And luckily everybody came to their aid and they brought anything that was made out of straw or hay for, for the animals, mats and shoes and slippers, because luckily hippopotamuses, Hannah, are herbivores, so they do not eat meat, they eat plants, herbs. And the last thing, which is probably my favorite part of the story, is that the family and the, the people that lived in the city of Budapest came together 
even when it was such a difficult time for them, they came together to help the animals in the zoo so that they would survive. Now, at the end of the story, we learned that the hippopotamuses, they never got fat again by the end of winter, but they survived. And that really made my heart so full to know that people care so much about animals, that they would work so hard together to make sure that they survived. Well, I hope you enjoyed my favorite parts of the story. Now let's get on to that writing. So if you are a third grader, you might wanna just pick one box to work on in our graphic organizer. If you are a fourth grader, maybe you're gonna work on two. And if you're a fifth grader, maybe you're gonna complete all three. Now, does that mean if you're a third grader, you stop at one box and say, I'm done? No. If you're able to fill out the second box and the third box, please go ahead and do it. We're having fun together and we're learning at the same time. So this is our brainstorming graphic organizer. So in this story, we were told about a special memory of the boy when he was little. So let's think back about some of our childhood experiences. Now, luckily you guys are very young, so that's not gonna be hard. I'm kind of older than you, so I'm gonna really have to think in there. <laughs> so do you have a favorite childhood memory that stands out? Does your family have a special place they visit often? Can you remember a time when you or someone in your family came up with a helpful solution for a problem? Uh, to a problem, sorry. Read through the questions, and if something doesn't come to your mind, I want you to speak to your parents and let them help you, navigate you, remind you of some things you might have forgotten. This is what it means to brainstorm. Now, this is a digital copy. So your teachers can upload this to Google Classroom or they can email it to you, however they assign things. If you do not work digitally still, you can work on your note, you can work on writing this in your notebook. Remember, it's just to have fun with learning at the same time. If you have Cami, even better, because I can actually write right on the document. So if I was going to do the writing right now, I would click on text box and I would click right in the first box to talk about a favorite childhood memory. So a favorite childhood memory of mine would be, now remember we're brainstorming, so we don't have to write tons of sentences. It can just be a couple of words just so that we know what we're gonna write about. I'm gonna put Christmas. Christmas Eve is a favorite childhood memory. That was my favorite holiday celebrating in, and I know I look forward to it every year. On the side here, we have a little circle, thought box, which is going to help us answer some more questions. Sorry, I don't know why that's popping up right now. So who was with you? Where were you? Why is it special? Use those questions to drive your answer to fill in the box. And if you can't write sentences or thoughts, you can also draw a picture to help you. The second part says, a special place your family visits. So again, we're gonna think about it. Discuss with your parents if you're having a hard time. Use the questions on the side to drive your answer. So what did that special place smell like? What do you see all around you? What sounds do you hear? A special place that we used to visit was my grandparents' house. And my grandparents' house always smelled like fresh sauce was being made, probably because it was. Always garlic. There's always, it always smelled like garlic. <laughs> what did I see all around? All my brothers and sisters running around. And what sounds did I hear? They always had Jeopardy on. Like, all day there was Jeopardy on or Giants games on. Very random. Now I know Jeopardy only comes on at seven o'clock at night, so I don't know how they had Jeopardy on. And the last box says a time when I or someone in my family solved a difficult problem and saved the day. How did you feel before the problem was solved? What was the emotion slash reaction the moment the problem was solved? So a time when I solved a difficult problem and solved the day is I found a stray animal. And I didn't know where his owner was. 
So I put up posters and I called the, the police and I called the veterinarians and I said, I found this dog. If anybody's looking for him, here's my mom's phone number. You can call and we will gladly give the dog back to his owner. So again, you can write a few words in each box. You can draw a picture, use the questions on the side to help brainstorm your ideas, chat with your family, they'll help you. When you feel confident in your graphic organizer, your brainstorming sheet, we're gonna move on to the next paper. So after deciding what you would like to write about, you're going to write your story in first person. Now, earlier we spoke about first person. First person narrative means it's coming from my point of view. I'm going to use the word I, me, my, we. I'm not going to use the word liberty, took the cat to the store. I'm not going to use the word she went to the store. I'm going to say I went to the store. So from the first document, you're going to pick one of the boxes to write about. So if you're in third grade, maybe you're gonna write all about your favorite childhood memory in first person. If you are in fourth grade, maybe you're gonna write two paragraphs, a favorite childhood memory, and maybe a time when you solved a difficult problem. If you are in fifth grade, maybe you're gonna write three paragraphs. So you're going to use each one of these questions to form a paragraph of three to five sentences. But the key is it has to be in first person. So remember, we're writing in first person. So if I was going to write this, I'm gonna pretend I'm a third grader. So I'm going to write about the lost dog. Lost dog, there's my title. And I'm going to start by saying I, or I'm going to say, when I was a little girl, I found a stray dog. I, ding, 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 first person, put up posters all around your town. I also called police to let them know I found a dog. The owner never looked for the dog. I begged my mother to let me keep the dog. She said yes. We named her Lucky. So I hope you enjoy this writing activity. Make sure you focus on your brainstorming, chat with your family, draw pictures, whatever helps you to get your creative juices flowing and then use your brainstorming graphic organizer to work on your paragraph, first person, point of view. And when you're finished, best part, draw a picture. I know everybody loves to see my drawings. So here we go, there's my little doggy. She was a little black Labrador. I mean, would it even be fun Friday if I didn't do a picture for you, if I didn't draw a picture? All right, make sure you add more detail. Make sure you have fun doing the paragraph and filling out your breath, uh, brainstorming document. And when you're finished, I'd love to see it. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us this fun Friday. Remember, fun Fridays are every Friday at 10 a.m. And next week will be our grades six to eight story time. But again, all ages are welcome to join. We'll be reading a story and then doing a fun activity. Um, but until then, we hope that you have a great week and a fun Friday. See you next week.